What's going on guys? Dave with Heights K9. Just got back from Chicago. Uh, I made a post while I was down there talking about wanting to do a Q&A show. Um, unfortunately, things got a little wild while we were down there. We didn't have a chance to do it, so we're getting it done now while we're back in Cleveland here. Um, just taking a break in between lessons. We got a lot of stuff going on that's pretty exciting up here. So uh, last December, we opened a facility in Columbus that's been really great. We've been putting a lot of emphasis uh, down there on getting that built up, learning the market. Uh, in addition to that, I've been doing monthly travels down to Chicago, as you guys know, um, doing some training down there, working with some clients. So things have been really exciting. Things have been growing a lot. Daycare has been expanding. Training has been expanding. The team has been expanding as a whole. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, so I'm trying to get back on a little bit more uh, quality content content for you guys, getting on YouTube, getting on Facebook a little bit more, stuff like that. So that's where this Q&A show is going to come. I'm going to try and do it once a week. Don't hold me to it. I'm going to try. Okay. So we're going to get started. Made a post on Instagram the other day asking for questions. We had about 20 submissions. I'm going to get through as many of these as I can. I want to keep it under 20 minutes. So starting now, we got our first question here. My dog keeps jumping and going crazy next door uh, at the dogs through the fence. I don't know what to do. All right. So Typical barrier frustration issues, we see very regularly that dogs are very reactive, whether it's through fences, whether it's through windows, whether it's out of a car, whether it's with a leash, whatever it may be, the barrier, the thing holding them back from getting to what they want to is creating frustration of some sorts. So a couple of things that I do this, uh, or that I do to work through this, is I teach them first and foremost what those barriers are. So there's a good chance if your dog is reacting through the fence, they're also reacting out on the walk. So I want to start to teach them slowly what those barriers mean. and I start with the walk usually. So I can teach them that that leash isn't always just restraint. Um, I teach them how to follow behind me where that leash is just there and not actually holding them back from doing anything. From there, I transition that to in the car. I transition that to fences, different things like that. Uh, and I communicate that boundary, right? So if they're rushing that fence line, I want to teach them that that fence isn't the only thing holding them back from the other dog. I'm holding them back from it also. I typically use remote collars for this uh, only due to the fact that, um, you know, if they're out in the yard, you can't always get right to them quickly when they start doing this. So with a remote collar, I have a half mile radius and I'm able to uh, communicate those boundaries a lot more clearly to them than I would with anything else. So put your remote collar on, turn it up to a motivating level. The second they rush that fence line, tell them no, give a tap on it, repeat that process at gradually higher levels until the dog moves away from the fence. We want to see them actually disengage from the fence here, not just stop barking. From there, you have a dog that understands what that barrier means and that we're actually communicating not to engage in that different thing. All right, next question. My dog does well on walks since we follow your tips. The only thing I'm struggling with is that he constantly wants to pee or smell things. He will stay behind me while doing this, but he does it way too much on our walk. I'm okay with him doing his business, but once he does one time, it seems like the rest are to mark his territory. Should I be allowing this or correcting for it? Um, so there's a couple things. First and foremost, you definitely should be communicating not to do that. So set one place that is potty time for the dog, one place you want them to go, whether it's a certain tree, whether it's a certain lawn, whatever it may be. And any time aside from that, we are not going to allow the dog to do it. A lot of times what I see though, when people are seeing the dog constantly stopping to mark the territory is we're kind of allowing it. So we'll be trying to get them to follow behind us, but every time they do decide to go do it, we'll slow down. Maybe we'll hesitate for a minute. We'll give them that second to do it, whatever it may be. I want you to keep walking through that. So if you're walking and your dog goes to pull off to go pee on a tree, you're going to start walking even quicker and you're going to get that leash to keep moving them along. They're going to start to realize through repetition of that, that they can't stop. There's no ability for them to stop because we're keeping moving. From there, if we still see some of it, same deal. Use your remote collar to correct for that. Use your pet convincer to correct for that. Whatever tool you're using to create those inhibitions, use that tool to tell that dog not to do it. But you have to make sure we're addressing that part of it first. We're not giving into those little things. We're not allowing them to rehearse that kind of shot stuff and we're showing them the crystal clear criteria that we want to hold them to in that situation. All right, next question. I can't get my dog to focus or listen to me when she's distracted. Squirrels, bunnies, etc. Treats, her name, a tug on the prong collar, nothing works. Any suggestions? Okay, so we got some, got some kids barking over there. You can keep rolling. Uh, we're good. Um, so, prey drive. Prey drive is really, really challenging. There's actually two things that are at play here based on your question that we're dealing with right now. So first and foremost is the idea of understanding prey drive and understanding just how strong it is for certain dogs. And then the second understanding that we need to come to the conclusion of here is that the prong collar in itself is an intermediate tool. It is not the tool that I use to get my dog's attention off of certain things or high level distractions or serious arousal or anything like that, right? So I use that tool 
as a stepping stone in between having no training and the remote collar, right? So it gives me a little bit of leverage, it helps to inhibit some pulling, and it helps to create some muscle memory of certain things, but it doesn't actually finish behaviors. So first, the prey drive, right? So we can't tell a dog necessarily that you know, you can't look at a squirrel, you can't look at a bunny, you can't look at a deer, you can't, you know, you can't do those things because they're designed for that kind of stuff, right? Genetically, those things are exciting to them. Those things create more and more arousal than just about anything else. Now, what we can do is we can teach them to control the impulse, right? So instead of teaching them to don't look, don't look, don't look, which is the common trend right now I see in dog training is just creating avoidance uh, of eye contact of certain things, which doesn't actually solve the problem, it just kind of puts a band-aid on it. I teach them to control that impulse. So when you see that squirrel or when you see that rabbit or whatever it may be, I don't want you engaging in it. And I don't do that through like swapping rewards or whatever it may be. A lot of people try and tell you to take treats and distract the dog and this and that. The problem is chasing those squirrels is one of the, the highest forms of positive reinforcement that we have for these dogs, right? So chasing that squirrel feels good. They like doing it. So they're gonna continue to do that. And unfortunately, pretty much any measly treat that you get in certain areas is not not going to be high enough value to get their attention off of that. So because of that, we need to create and attach a consequence to the behavior that we're looking to correct for. As any time, uh, when we're using aversives or we're using consequences, we have to be as clear as we can about what it is that we don't want the dog to do. So in this case, it's motion towards the dog. So bouncing back for a second to the conversation about the prong collar, you need to get the dog on a remote collar, or if you're not gonna get the dog on a remote collar, you need to find something the dog cares about significantly more than the prong collar, right? So pet correctors sometimes can be highly, highly motivating to dogs. And if you're not gonna use a, uh, an e-collar, a bonker can also be highly, highly motivating to that dog. But you need to figure out what the correct tool is gonna be for them. Like I said, remote collar is the easiest. I would recommend that. I have videos on how to teach the dog to walk behind you with a remote collar, as well as videos on different things that I look for or do in order to tackle like prey drive and other things like that. Anyways, so if the dog is on a remote collar, you would same deal find a level that's motivating to the dog, a level that they care about with that distraction present. So when a squirrel is present or when a rabbit is present or whatever is present, we need to know that this level is enough to get their attention in that situation, right? From there, what I do is I watch the dog and I correct for any forward movement towards that object, right? So dogs here, squirrels there, paws are there. I'm not worried about the squirrel, I'm worried about the paws right now. The second I see this, no, correct, right? We're acting or we're correcting for that impulse there and we're not using sitter down to do it, we're just telling them not to move towards. A lot of times what you'll see is the dog will start backing up in those situations, they'll start moving away and uh, that impulse will kind of get reversed a little bit. This would be the same process if anybody uh, struggles with issues of arousal towards other dogs, reactive on the walk, stuff like that. I look at it exactly the same way. So first step, get on an e-collar, get your dog e-collar conditioned or find a tool that's gonna be highly motivating to the dog with those distractions present Two, teach the dog to follow behind you. Three, tackle the impulse. That's all we care about right now. All right, next question. <clears throat> we have a chain link fence between Cliff and the two neighbor dogs. The alpha dog keeps challenging Cliff through the fence with stare downs and barking nonstop. Cliff typically ignores the barking and the stare downs. We try, we try to stop those when they happen, but my main issue is if all three dogs are along the fence, um, the one will show her teeth at Cliff, throwing him into defensive mode. I discipline her and interrupt the behavior and mark with a no. I'm not going to bring him in any time the neighbor dogs come out and I can't be outside every second Cliff is. How can we deal with this when the problem is the other dogs and really the owners? So these are somewhat unfortunate circumstances obviously because yes, like it does get really, really challenging for certain dogs. If a dog is pestering them, pestering them, pestering them for them to not react in those situations, right? At some point, the dog keeps barking, your dog is gonna get frustrated by it. Now, the problem here is Cliff is sometimes reinforcing that behavior. So just like anything, most behavioral issues are created through positive reinforcement, like we talked about with the last question. And because of that, Cliff, through reacting back, even if it's only sometimes, is strengthening their behavior that they're showing in certain areas, right? So if they're barking, 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 and Cliff never does anything about it, never reacts to it, eventually that barking is gonna stop because they realize it's not accomplishing what they want it to accomplish. They're, they're just gonna give up, right? Um, but the problem is he's still reacting at 
times to it. So what we need to do is we need to hold Cliff to a higher level at this point. We need to find a tool that's motivating for him. So this is a dog that comes to daycare. We've never done any training with him, but we know him pretty well. Um, and we know that he's, you know, there's a lot of things he's very not motivated by, right? So he's a pretty stoic dog in certain areas. Plus, in addition to that, he's a very, very good dog at avoiding certain things, right? So in that case, same concept we've talked about with the very first question with fence reactivity, an e-collar is gonna be the best bet. We gotta get Cliff on an e-collar. We gotta start using that so he realizes, one, he can't avoid corrections. Two, we have something that's gonna be more motivating to him in certain situations. And three, communicating what those boundaries mean to him in that situation, uh, just like with any issues that we may be seeing in certain areas. So um, same concept with the e-collar, find a motivating level around that distraction, teach him to stay away from the fence and disengage from it. Now, in addition to that, I've had some clients have very good success with this, and this is, I don't know what kind of relationship you have with your neighbors. I don't know if they're gonna get pissed at you. I don't know if they're gonna come over knocking on your door saying you're, I don't know, torching their dogs or something like that. Get one of two things. You could get an air horn or you can get a pet corrector or a squirt bottle. And when those dogs start rushing to the fence and acting a fool, you can go over them and you can correct them for it. Um, so, you know, like I said, that's, that's your choice if you decide to do that at that point. I personally would do it because I don't want dogs pestering my dog all the time and making things more tricky for them, especially if I'm trying to work through certain issues with my dog. But again, you might, uh, you know, might hinder those, uh, those relationships a little bit, but I would recommend giving it a go because screw it, who cares about them anyways, right? All right, next question. I have a nine week old GSP. He's having a tough time potty training. I take him out every half hour to 45 minutes. He eats when we go out. Um, I can stay out with him on the leash for 20 minutes or so and he still comes inside and goes potty. Please give me any kind of tips, please. All right, so um, from the sounds of it, if you're staying outside for 20 minutes or so, he's not actually rehearsing going to the bathroom out there, right? So you're never successfully creating that association of go outside, right? So what we need to do in this situation is we need to uh, show him that the only way that he's getting freedom in the house is by going outside. And I've talked about this a lot. It's a really, really simple concept that a lot of people miss on. So we utilize the crate, we utilize a leash here. So every time you get home or every time you're getting ready to let the dog out to go to the bathroom, if you think that they need to go, they should be in the crate, you should leash them up, you should walk them outside and give them five to 10 minutes out there. Let them sniff around, let them sniff around, let them sniff around. If they don't go, this is the big difference. We're not gonna let them loose in the house because they haven't earned that freedom yet. I know they still have to go in these situations. Instead, I'm gonna take them inside. I'm gonna put them right back in the crate. Maybe I'll leave them in there for 15 or 20 minutes or so. Then I repeat that cycle. I leash them up, I take them outside, I do it again. For certain dogs, this may take a while, right? So this process could take, I don't know, two hours before they make that connection of needing to go outside. But the big thing is they're gonna realize the second that they go outside, we make a big party about it, we reward for it, we take them inside, we give them some freedom and we let them play around and stuff there, but they're earning that freedom by going to the bathroom outside, right? So we have to be able to make that connection in certain situations with the dog. We need to make sure that they understand really, really clearly that's the only way they're getting the freedom inside. Uh, I had one dog, this is the same concept. I've worked with a couple of dogs that um, like either didn't want to go to the bathroom on the walk or on leash or just didn't want to go to the bathroom in the yard and I've repeated the same process. I had a dog that came in that they were moving to a house with uh, no fence, they didn't have a yard and they needed the dogs to learn how to go to the bathroom on a leash. But they previously had been used to just going in the yard. They didn't have the ability to do that anymore. So we did that same process. And the one dog, I remember it taking almost all day for it to go to the bathroom inside first. She held it, held it, held it, held it, held it until finally she literally could not hold it anymore and she wound up, uh, she wound up using it on the leash. And then from there that process gets quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker until they understand what it is. Obviously heavily reinforce them going outside. We want to make sure we're making that good connection with them of what it is that we want them to do. So um, give that a whirl. Uh, do that for a little bit. And like I said, it's a, it's a patience game. Got a nine week old puppy, right? They're going to have accidents. You're going to, you're going to fuck up a little bit sometimes. You just got to make sure that uh, you're making that right association with them and you're getting them over that hurdle, but do that process. That'll work. Alrighty. Next question. <clears throat> We have Trip walking behind us constantly and we are starting to walk past other dogs at a safe distance. Um, is sniffing okay, but what about uh, drifting in the direction of the stiff? Specifically staying behind me, but drifting to the side of the other dog. 
Uh, is it time for a correction or is it acceptable? They've been correcting. Okay, so Trips a dog we've been doing a little bit of work with. I think I've done two lessons with them so far. Uh, this dog had serious leash aggression issues. This dog had serious leash issues towards people and dogs. Uh, and, and currently actually uh, was, was being walked on muzzle all the time and still is as we're working through these problems with this dog. So, um, yeah, absolutely correct for it, right? So when we're out on the walk, we need to teach our dog essentially to totally ignore everything else going on, right? So if I'm walking here in Edgewater with all these people around, or um, prime example, we got uh, two people over there doing an on-leash greeting while one of them is, can you, can you pan over to this real quick? This is ridiculous. Okay. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is how dog fights happen, guys. So, okay, cool. Let's, let's turn it back before they get mad at us. <laughs> Are we sending send it again here? Okay, cool. So don't do that. That's a bad thing to do. You don't want to do that. That is how dog fights happen. So let me, t let me explain to you what was just happening in that situation. So we have two dogs. They don't know each other. They're both on leashes. Both leashes have tension on them. And one of the humans is petting the other dog while it's going on. So we don't ever do on leash greetings. There's a couple of reasons for that. I talk about this a lot here. Um, one of the primary reasons for it is because it puts enormous, enormous amounts of social pressure on the dogs. And in addition to that, the dog is restrained, right? So if you think about it, if that dog is restrained in a certain area, if they feel like they can't get away, right? They're on a short six foot leash, four foot leash, whatever it may be. They can't get away from that other dog if they start getting stressed out, even if they technically could move two or three feet. So what happens, you remove flight completely from them and you go right into fight at that point, right? So the dog typically starts reacting because they learn that that's the only thing that makes the other dog go away in certain situations, right? In addition to that, remember, praise is one of the highest forms of positive reinforcement that we have for our dogs. And because of that, our dogs, you know, like it's reinforcing not only physical behaviors, but emotional states of mind. So say that dog was insecure, right? Say that dog didn't like the other dog and we were trying to tell them that's okay that's okay that's okay that's us thinking like a human right we want to console our dog we want to console people and that's how we would do it if it were a human or a baby or something like that but the problem is it's a dog right they think like dogs all they can understand is yes and no and unfortunately praise no matter what we're saying when we're giving it all it means is yes. So if that dog is thinking, I want this dog to go away, I'm really stressed out, I'm uncomfortable, and we're saying, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay, you're reinforcing the likelihood of them doing that. So impromptu little thing there. Don't, don't do that, just stop. Don't do that. Okay, back to the question. Trip, sniffing other dogs, drifting in the direction of the sniff. Tell him no, he does not need to be meeting other dogs while he's out on the walk. He does not need to be sniffing other dogs on the walk. And he definitely does not need to be moving in the direction of the other dogs in that situation. We've talked a little bit about uh, tackling the impulse, so not moving in the direction of the other dog. It gets a little bit harder to see when we're actually walking past them, obviously, because when we're standing still, they're not moving at all, right? So if, we, if they do move towards the dog, we can see it. So as you're passing other dogs, keep your eyes on your dog, any sort of drift in that direction, tell them no, give them a correction for that, teach them to mind their own business. All right, we're gonna do one last question here right now. So let me pull it up. Okay, so uh, find a good one here. All right, this is a good one. Sleeping in the bed with humans, yes or no and why? FYI, multiple dogs, youngest currently showing aggression towards the alpha. Get them off of the bed. Guys, come on. So this is one, this is one of those situations where I always say, furniture, beds, you know, like all sorts of different things that we do with our dogs that, you know, stuff like that. They're privileges, not rights, right? Your dog is not entitled to sleep in the bed in different situations. Your dog is not entitled to lay on the furniture in different situations, right? Your dog is not entitled to do any of those things. They earn those things, right? So they earn that through correct behavior. And you already told me here, that the youngest is showing aggression towards the other dog. Get that dog off of the bed. There's no reason for it. It shows the dog that they're in an equal position to us. It gives them a boundary, or doesn't give them a boundary of, you know, you, you, you can't do this. Us communicating something that we don't want them to do in certain situations. And because of that, nine times out of 10, when they're on the bed, they're laying on top of us, right? They're cuddling with us, things like that. And they're viewing us as a resource when they're doing that. So I don't allow any of those things until I know that I have my dogs totally under control, right? If I have two dogs that are getting into fights with each each other and one of them's laying on top of me while you know on the bed or on the couch or whatever it may be well that dog's gonna feel more likely to guard me in that situation if they don't want to so it's gonna create nothing but problems I always recommend initially 
as you're working through problems, if you're having any sort of relationship dynamic problems or anything like that, get the dogs off of the furniture, kick them off of it until you get those things under control first. From there, we set uh, rules for being allowed on the furniture, right? So my dogs, they're allowed on the couch sometimes, they're allowed on the bed sometimes, but not all of the time. They're not allowed to just jump up whenever they want to in different areas, right? They have to be invited up in those situations. So if they do it just on their own without being invited, I'm gonna correct them for it. I'm gonna tell them not to do it and I'm gonna get them off of there. Um, and then from there, once my dog is not trying to do it anymore, then I'll begin allowing them up and I'll begin inviting them up. But only after I have ground rules set. So that's the last question. Everybody's yelling. I was gonna do a half hour of this, but everybody's telling me that was gonna be too long. So I tried to keep it under 20 minutes. We're probably at about like 24 right now or something. Um, let me know if you wanna see longer. I have no problem rolling with this for like 45 minutes. Uh, you know, as long as you guys are gonna watch it. But I feel like, I don't know people are gonna get pissed at me if I keep doing that. So, first Q&A show, success, Edgewater. There's tons of people around looking at me right now. I mean, there's gotta be like two, I mean, there, there's gotta be like 25 people around right now thinking I'm a total weirdo here. But I'll keep doing it if you guys keep watching it. So, that's it.